Good afternoon and welcome in to the SPL. It's Saturday. We're in week two and it's Finch and Mifflin that are going to be bringing you into this big day worth of action. And we've really had, I think, Mifflin, a lot of really good sets up until now. The SPL has absolutely delivered in terms of competitive, really close matches where you don't know who's going to be winning it and upsets and all that stuff, too. So today is absolutely going to continue on that, I'm thinking. I do, too. And today, we finally get to see Sanguine get tested against one of these top-tier teams. I'm really excited to see that. This squad has been performing so well as a unit that I'm excited to see how they can compete against the best. I think you're right. It's going to be a test for both these teams, right? This is the schedule. You can see it is going to be the Space Station Sanguine matchup first. The Knights and Obey will battle later. It's, it's going to be telling because for Space Station, there's a chance for them to come out and go, okay, we are that top dog that everyone thinks. I think a lot of people have them as kind of the one overall seed right now. If they can take care of Sanguine, they kind of confirm that. On the other side, Sanguine, after trouncing Obey, are on the up, right? They can prove that they are this sort of up-and-coming team if they're competitive up against Sanguine. If they can give them a run for their money or, obviously, even if they win there's a lot of fan support behind this team from what i saw in terms of their predictions here are the standings right now radiance our only undefeated squad with two wins sanguine and space station have not lost yet either though that will change shortly after this one and myth i, I think that you're so right this could be a telling match for both these squads it really will be i mean Beating out Obey right now, maybe not the best look for Sanguine, but it certainly is a great way to start <laughs> off the sure. season. But now that they're competing against SSG, who I've been hailing as the kings of the SPL, I'm really excited to see how these guys are going to perform. And so much of what makes this Space Station team strong myth, it's Raffer in the support role for me, man. This guy just continually finds ways to get it done. He plays with different picks than what other people plays with. He's always right there providing the peel when you need it. He's not unwilling to die for his team, as long as that means the setup is there for the squad as well. And then you've got guys who are pretty good at the game. I don't know, like Cherio, right? Like like Dardes, like Vote. Those guys are the ones following up off of Raffer once he finds that sick setup. And then obviously Nika does what he does from the solo lane too. This roster, to me... It, it, it does center around Raffer, but everyone on it is so individually talented. It's what makes them so hard to stop. It really is. I mean, no matter who you are, if you've got Vote, Dardes, and Nika at your back, it's going to go <laughs> well. And Raffer and Sherio aren't sleeping either. These guys are going to be carrying the squad. So these are five just incredibly talented individual players who have been playing together for an incredibly long time as well. So even as a unit, we see that they're going to perform well. Whereas SSG, or uh, Sanguine rather, is just... I think they're the best team. They work the best together, even if they individually aren't the most talented mechanical players. Their teamwork, their their ability to play off of each other is at such a high level that I think it elevates them. The the sum of the parts is uh, greater than the whole. Is that it? Or I don't know how to word things. Yeah, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? There and, it is. And I think that you're that you're exactly right on that point, right? I don't know that you would take Sanguine over a lot of other people individually, like in their roles, but together they do sort of form this Voltron, right? As a as a unit. And, and for me, it starts with Shinto, where I think it starts with the support on the side of Space Station. For Sanguine, for me, man, I think it starts out of that middle lane. This guy is a killer. He plays just about whatever it is that he wants, and he's always able to get into the right positions. But it's been his synergy with Panatom as well, I think, that, that's been really hard for other teams to try and match up. What, what is it? Is it just this teamwork, or what is it that makes the Sanguine team so hard for other squads to lock down? I think it is truly the fact that they play so well off of each other as a team. I mean, if one of them gets picked out, they know how to peel out their squad, and they know how to cut losses immediately. Their communication core is incredibly good. The second they get a lead, they know how to play off of it as well. Everything that Sanguine does is so impressive from a, a strategic standpoint. And and everyone everyone that's playing in the SPL is hungry, right? Everyone wants to win, but Sanguine have a different kind of hunger, I think. They're, they're from the bottom looking up, right? They've never been there before. Everyone else has been kind of at that top tier, been competitive for a world title before. And Sanguine, this is kind of their first ride, right? I think that is the sort of energy, the momentum that this team brings in when they play. If, if you all are friends with these guys, hop on Smite, they do not stop playing. I don't know when they sleep. I do not know when they eat. They are just constantly grinding smite i mean yeah me and you have queued up some uh 2 a.m casuals together and got slammed <laughs> by the entirety of sanguine in a casual yeah, 3 a.m smite queue it's, it blows my mind they, and it's got to be a, a great confidence booster for them and a great team building exercise i'm glad that you brought up their hunger i think i can relate to them a little bit on that level having come from console and then moving to pc maybe similar to this uh going from latam coming over to na and the sbl they have that anger. They feel like they need to prove themselves, and I think that does drive them a lot. 
yeah, a bit of a chip on their shoulder, but it's kind of hard for us to speak exactly to what these, these guys are feeling. So instead, I sat down with Rongu and I asked him to have a chance to hear some of his thoughts. I'm here with Rongyu, support for Sengwen. And Rongyu, man, first things first, congrats on the big win in week one. I'm sure that meant a lot to you guys. What does it mean to be able to start your, your, your whole real SPL careers really off on such a clean note? Yeah, thank you. Um... It started us a lot because our we thought like it was going to be like bad because we were like okay this is our first match because we knew we were doing well in scrims but we didn't know if we were doing well for SPL so it was a good start hopefully we can just keep going and we can get better results next time. And, and you guys are going to be going up against Space Station here for your next set, Rongyu. And specifically, you're going to be matching up against Raffer, one of the best supports ever, maybe just one of the best players ever. Uh, how are you going to have to match his performance to the set? Like, how important is it going to be for you to try and equal out his value? Yeah, I think Raffer is probably one of the best supports right now. He's pretty, he's good. Uh, as I told you, we have Scream probably every team, except mm -hmm. for Obey, but I think we pretty much have won at least half of our screams, so I think we can do pretty well. We just have to do the same thing with doing screams in SPL, and I think we, we're going to do well. Do you guys have any strategies for trying to limit Raffer or Dardes in particular, or do you guys just come in the same way that you approach every team? Yeah, I think we have a plan for Raffer. Probably not a cheeky strat, but I think we can stop his things. <laughs> You got to try and slow that guy down some way. So I totally yeah. get it. Well, well, you guys have uh, such a supportive fan base. I feel like whenever you all are playing, even when you're in the SML, like chat suddenly gets flooded with all this like sanguine support and stuff. How much it mean for you guys to have such a loyal sort of following that always shows up for you guys and and make sure they're supporting? Yeah, I mean, pretty much we all, we are here because all the supports, all the fans, our families. The, the Latam guys are always there cheering for us. So this is an awesome opportunity for us because we know we are representing Latin America and not a team. Well, I think you all are representing them well. Everyone talks so much about you guys' grind and passion for the game. Well, good luck in your set, Rongyu. I appreciate you taking some time here to talk with us. I'm looking forward to getting to see you play. Thank you. Always great to get a chance to hear from Rongyu, and he's looking pretty good as well in that Maxonomic chair. Huh? Remember, you all can look just as good as Rongyu if you head to needforseatusa.com. Make sure you're using code SMITEMAX. That's 50 bucks off as well as you can get that customized with that savings that you got. So if you want to put the goat on the back, if you want to put your carry on there, whatever it is to need, you can put that on that Maxonomic seat. And I think the important thing that, that we heard them talking about there a little bit, a, a, little, a little bit Mifflin, was how much these teams are, are really are grinding the game. That's why I love to get a chance to hear from wrong you whenever i talk to anybody else about this team behind the scenes they say that they're actually kind of smacking in scrims now throughout smite's history being doing super successful in scrims isn't always the best thing but i don't know for 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 sanguine it feels a bit different to me i think these other teams haven't figured them out yet yeah i mean personally i don't think i've ever won a scrim in my life <laughs> Full stop, but it works out for me. But hearing that Sanguine is going to perform as well as they do in scrims here is going to be very impressive. Winning 50% of your scrims is not easy, especially considering some of those scrim nights can go for three, four, five hours straight. It's not easy to yeah. keep your level of play at that high tier. But it's hard for me to keep my, my competitive integrity right now. I mean, I'm rooting for Sanguine simply because sure. every single one of the guys is so lovable, so humble. That interview really made me a fan. Dude, I'm glad to hear it, man. And when you talk to them, you can just tell these guys are passionate about playing. The problem is, there's as much passion on the other side, man. Space Station might be a bit more aloof, but these guys want to win at the end of the day. So I promise there's no deficit of that coming from the Space Station boys either. We are absolutely into these picks and bans. And I thought some of the changes that we saw happen in that bonus balance patch might mean that maybe we wouldn't see quite as much of these gods. But we're seeing a lot of the same ones taken away. Yamoja, Kamazots, the Persephone. They're not letting these gods through right now, Mifflin. But because of this hell ban that Space Station made, Merlin comes through. And I've already highlighted how important I think Shinto is. And you're giving him possibly just one of the best mages in the game right now. That is scary. 
Also a mage that he has shown time and time again that he's completely comfortable on. Merlin on the mid lane is going to be able to control fights once they come his way, as well as opens up the door for early objectives, simply off the back of how much objective burn that he does have. However, SSG not willing to give up too much, picks up that Uller in the long lane, which might be able to deter some of those early gold furies. It's so funny. I feel like you and I spent a long time talking about these two gods in particular yesterday when we were watching the set that happened yesterday. And, and we we're talking about how Jormungandr just feels like the kind of god you pick if you just want to be safe in lane. Almost like Wukong if he did more, right? There's just no chance that Jorm's really going to die in most cases. And then this Uller is just pressure in a box, right? You just pick Uller, you put him in lane, and you have the pressure in that lane. You always have kill potential against just about any matchup over there. So I love these first picks for Space Station, especially that you add this Raiden onto it. This is going to be an aggressive comp. Yeah, how did you word that Uller pick to me yesterday? If you think you're the better hunter, you're just going to win no matter what. Uh, I yeah. think that maybe that confidence might come into play here. However, Jingwei is going to bring a certain level of safety, despite the fact that Uller does pick up three, four kills. We saw Snoopy as well yesterday picking that Jingwei for that safety. If you die, you're back in lane instantly. <laughs> That's right. Snoopy was getting a bit bodied in lane, and he didn't really fall behind, did he? He just floated right back in using that rapid reincarnation, so not bad at all for the Jing Wei. But Space Station seem really worried about these healers, don't they? Even with the Merlin already picked, they do come back and ban this Aphrodite as well, perhaps worried that that might get taken over to the solo lane, as now that Kuz and Bobian hover here for Space Station, they've already got the Yorms. So this had to be for Rapper in the support role if he wants to take this. Yeah, Raffer has shown that he is comfortable on Kuzumbo. That god allows you to play as far up and as out of position as you want. Not many characters in Smite can literally punish you for uh, hitting them. So maybe Raffer is going to play a little bit more aggressive than we're used to seeing, tank up some of those ultimates and reflect as much damage as humanly possible. Man, you say it a lot nicer on stream. Whenever we're playing, you say, ah, punished for playing the game correctly, I see. It's it. It makes you miserable. So yeah, that's what Kuzabo does. Maybe makes you feel bad about hitting some of your stuff. Sanguine on the other side. Pick up the Serket and the King Arthur. So the healers did not end up quite coming through. Maybe that's space season we're worried about, but maybe that's because they banned them all away. Instead, it should be that King Arthur over there for Nika. And then the Serket in the jungle instead for Cheerio. This is something that he does like to play. He does. I'm looking at SSG's comp, and it's so strong. They've got every phase of the game covered. Hunbot should be able to get them through just about anything that they need to in the early game, making sure that Raijin reaches the late. His Raijin's early game, a little bit weaker than most mages, especially mm -hmm. compared to Merlin. However, around level 20, he's a late game artillery strike from long range. Anything that walks towards him is going to fall. And I think Hunbot brings just enough out of the jungle to get him there. Yeah, sorry if I had a mild panic attack there. I just can't believe Unbots gets to get 10th picked. That god's so strong right now. The Fear No Evil, a potent tool over there on the side for Space Station to try and take into this next game. But Mifflin, based on these drafts, I can already tell there's going to be an aggressive back-and-forth matchup here between these two teams. It's Sanguine up against Space Station. Game number one about to start. Much appreciated, Finch. Dolson and Agro on the call for game number one between Sanguine and SSG. And, and Agro, I got to admit, I mean, my, my heart is being pulled two different directions in this one. My, my brain is being pulled in two different directions in this one between Sanguine and SSG. I couldn't tell you who I think is going to win. I couldn't tell you who I, I want to win this one. I think by every metric, this is going to be a, a very close matchup. I think the the word test is perfect. We know I know that both Mifflin and Finch were using it quite a bit during that pregame desk, and I think that it fits perfectly because this is the first test for for both of these teams. It feels like with the with the higher end of competition. I mean, both these teams played against Obey and Renegades so far, and and while those teams, specifically Renegades, looked a little bit better, a little bit ahead of schedule, so to speak, I think that it's fair to say that this is a higher level than what we expected from those first right. sets. I agree, and, and I think some questions will be answered, of course, about both of these two teams and maybe where they stand. And this is a battle to stay up to pace with Radiance, who are 2-0 and up to this point in the SPL. Both of these two teams 1-0, and so trying to tie up there for first. And, and one thing I noted in, in picks and bans was the continued presence of Merlin versus Raijin Hello. in the mid lane, but it's Raijin in the long lane this time, and he's going to fall for first blood as Netrioid has found the opening. Vote just did not respect that blink in from Rongyu. Raffer had already used his blink to try and zone Netrioid away from that ghost minion and delay him getting level two, but that's just synergy right there between Rongyu and Netrioid. Rongyu blinks in, hits the fracture. Vote, you have to pre-beads that. You cannot afford to get hit by that stun, because then if you get knocked up, 
you're just dead. And we've, we've got a boosh beads alert for first blood, but <laughs> it, it's not going to work even if you beads. Really, frankly, when that knockup starts, I think that you need to pre-beads that stun coming from the fracture or else you're just going to take too much damage. Sitting at only level one means that you don't have that jump to get away. And that's just so tough, especially with kind of how Finch was looking at it, where, where you want this Kuzumbo to be aggressive, but instead SSG under duress again. Perfect. Botus already uses disengage Netrioid in for the second time in two minutes. Second blood over to Sanguine. Man, Netrioid just knew exactly where Vote's out was. The only way Vote gets out there is maybe if he dashes to the right and gets into the jungle. But this is so smart by Sanguine, what they're doing right now. They did this after First Blood as well. They're holding the wave. They're not pushing this wave that you normally see teams push because they want to go get their jungle and go get their buffs and that kind of stuff. But at that point, nothing is up for them to take anyways past the Alpha Harpy. And that takes so long, it's not really worth that much gold. Let's hold the wave and then bring Vote to a point where he has to be basically on our tower line again. And we've just got way more range than he does. He gets hit by a full CC chain. Netrioid lands the persistent gust. As soon as he lands from that, he gets knocked up by the Horus. And then Netrioid just reads exactly where Vote's going to dash back towards his tower. And now, no way Vote can step up at all. <laughs> He's sitting on boots one. And Netriard has already proven that he just has the range to compete with that level of extra movement speed. Yeah, per perfect synergy, perfect wave control as well from Sanguine on the back of two kills two minutes into this game. It, I feel like whatever it's been, even if it was just yesterday, we, we've kind of seen this return to this traditional duo lane in the long lane and now get maybe a glimpse of what this lane will look like for the next few minutes. Vote can't even move himself forward. But I also seen like feel like we've seen a return to a lot of kills as well kind of stemming out of this long lane and maybe even one more. No beads, no dash, no problem. Netrioid moves in for his third kill of the game, keeping pace with a kill a minute. Yeah, frankly, I just don't think players are used to this level uh, anymore, uh, this style uh, of two on two. And, and it's been so long since it's been two on two in this duo lane. It's been so long since you really have to worry about kill pressure pre five anywhere but the mid lane. You just can't step up to that at all. And Raffer leaves because he's probably thinking, well, I can't save you. If you right. get all into like that, how am I going to save you? But Raffer kind of needs to be there just to try and do something. And I like this quite a bit. Put Vote in the mid lane and just take him away from this CC chain. But now it's Panatops here. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, now he just gets blinked on in the mid lane. And he's going to dash out. The wrong use there waiting. Vote taken low. Panatom dashes through four kills. All of them. On to vote. Talk about a rough He's early game here, here for this Raijin. That's embarrassing. Yeah, that's th th that just can't oh, be happening, really, in the mid lane. You just cannot afford to step up there with, without any sort of aggressive board coverage. At this point, I mean, vote is just minion number seven in whatever wave he walks <laughs> up to. He's just not, he's not a god at this point. And Sanguine is doing such a good job of really pressuring him. They just got to try and find Space Station somewhere to get an advantage. Well, Netrioid doesn't care who's in his lane. He wants to stay aggressive. Rongyu is here as well. Can close that gap. Darda's knocked up, but just out of range of Rongyu. Uh, but talk about the presence that not, not only Netrioid has had early in this game, but, but Rongyu as well. It, it seems everywhere this Horus goes, a, a kill is snowballing somewhere. Four kills in five minutes, and he's got four assists. He's been a part of every single one of them, and he's been critical in every single one of them. This is, I, I think Rongyu and Panatom were the two that had the biggest microscope coming into this SPL season because Shinto and, and Netrioid have really popped off in their land performances. Yorkor as well had a big microscope on him because he hadn't got a chance to travel for land or anything like that. But I think the prevailing theory about Sanguine was that they have a lot of players who could play really well at a high level. Can Panatom and Rongyu really match that level and so far they've both been lights out yep. so far in season seven wrong looked phenomenal on every single god he's played yamoja horus a lot of different styles for sanguine support and panatom has hard carried games on thor he's hard carried games on the yep. circuit he's been everywhere that he needs to be the whole of sanguine has stepped up to this level and, and if there were some doubters somehow after they made it to worlds <laughs> last year literally worlds by the way they wouldn't be able to, to play at this level consistently, then uh, I don't think that there's any questions now. Well, this time, Vote will be able to escape beneath that mid lane tier one tower, but but he is, Vote has been back in base effectively on cooldown for the first six and a half minutes 
of this one. And I, I love that the conversation around Sanguine kind of has started out with that their synergy is going to take them places. But I think it's starting to get to the point now where, where they are... I mean, there, there was never any question that they're mechanically skilled. But I think this is a team that's starting to have a little bit of both. There is some solo lane presence here from SSG, and maybe that's what you need here. It seems like the only lane for Sanguine that is not far and away ahead is in this solo lane. So maybe Cherio has the right idea in trying to get something going there for Nika. But it's so hard to gank that King Arthur. I mean, even though you're Hun Bats, if he just times his, his Excalibur's Wrath well, it's going to be difficult for you to kill him at all, let alone not get killed in the process. Well, wrong you blinked, or Dardes rather, blinked on Netrioid there for some follow-up. But finally, an engagement won't result in the kill, and instead maybe it's SSG that'll add one to their column. But... That is going to be Raffer thinking twice about fully engaging on this one. Remember, this is a three-kill Jing Wei. If you overstay, Netriad will plug away just okay. enough damage, and he wants a little bit more airstrike up. We'll connect for some damage, but no kills this time. Raffer stays alive. Panatom just around the corner. Some fireworks, but no kills. All right, that, that was Netrioid feeling himself <laughs> a little bit right there. That was a bit of a heat check to try and solo Raffer right there. But you know what? I've got no problem with it. When you're 3-0 this early, you've been dominating lane you you kind of get that option to, to try and That's see right. yourself on the heat check. And when I'm talking about pre beadsing by the way, Dardes shows you what that means right there. He gets blinked on by Ronkyu. It uses beads before that crowd control even hits him. So he still takes the damage, but never gets affected by the CC. If he gets affected by that knockup, he probably dies, knowing that his jump is already down. But he was very, very quick on the relic usage and kept himself alive but that's still saying when forcing space station to make the play properly four yep. times this game vote has not made that play properly that time Darnes did well, raffer blinked on stunned down wrong you might be the one in range to finish off the kill but panatom would like it on the circuit and he'll surely get it that's five kills on the board eight and a half minutes in for sanguine and that's the second for the sanguine jungler panatom starting to hit some kills early as well I don't know that Cherio knows he's been tracked. Now he does, hearing that ward behind him. And Rongyu's here, but with no blink available, I don't think they're going to be able to stop Cherio on his pathing. Cherry, of course, always loves to go between Tier 1 and Tier 2 Tower. I think he's one of the hardest junglers to keep track of in the league as far as where he wants to go. Could be bad to worse here for Vote, but luckily this time, at least some, some health, whether it's passive, just gaining it through his leveling, Vote is able to get himself out alive. And I think it's a win at this point that, that Vote died four times, four or five minutes into this game. The fact that we've now doubled that time and, and he hasn't had any more deaths, I think that's got to be a win here for SSG, that now this Raijin is able just to breathe and maybe get some gold in his back pocket. This lead could be far bigger for Sanguine. Space Station has done a good job riding the ship, but... They're, they're still sinking. It's just more slowly than, than you would have expected. They, they do need to start finding wins eventually. It, at this pace, Sanguine will win the game, but not by 22 minutes. Now, the, the thing that stood out to me the most about Space Station, having gone back and watched their games from last week, seen what they did at the Pittsburgh Knights tournament, I don't think there's any team in the league better at closing games quickly than Sanguine. Once they get that lead, they end games really really fast and, it, and it's kind of like they you know they're in the boxing ring against their opponent and they see you stagger they they go for the kill faster than anyone else right. in the league and so i i think that teams will start to identify that they, they can start setting up beforehand what the the big advantage of ending games quickly is that you don't give your opposition a moment to say okay we're down by this much they're going to go for this then they're probably going to go for this and if we play if we give this up but contest this and pull beads here and then try and get you know get them on the phoenix they don't give you a chance to set all that up but i think teams will start to quicken the pace of deciding what they want to do when behind against sanguine i don't know right. that that's always going to be the case that they're just going to snuff out their opponents in the blink of an eye but that is something that teams have to be prepped for now is is how quickly they end games that sanguine's car might not be the fastest in the league but it has the best acceleration for sure best zero to 60 time in the league and you talk about kind of how the, the, the sort of starting point to that was that this lead could be a lot bigger, and it, it really could be, right? I mean, it's about a 1,000 gold lead with five kills on the board for Sanguine, none for SSG. In aggro, I, I'd argue that the majority of that gold differential is, is on vote and then kind of evenly 
distributed uh, to, the, to the other members of Sanguine because you look at Solo Lane largely, even Cherio even has a level advantage over Panatom. I mean, the, the, the way out of this game might have just been if, if Vota's not strong enough to even fight. But SSG still have four members of their team that I think could be largely effective in some of these early fights that we might start seeing around this Gold Fury. Yeah, but someone's got to try and do something to Shinto, man. I mean, he's level 14. He's got 7,600 net worth right now. Hard Just to ignore now, that. now, a couple people hit 7,000. <laughs> he is huge right now. And, and I don't know how you really stop him. Merlin's not falling off towards the late game either. He's a phenomenal late game mage. So that's a that's the biggest concern right now for Space Station in my mind. Yep. Is, is Vote going to be able to do effective things on the Raijin? And who in the world is going to be able to kill Shinto? Because I, I don't know that you really can. He hasn't finished this third item yet. He's probably pretty close to that Soul Reaver, I'd imagine. As soon as he gets that, I think Sanguine should be pulling gold. Yeah, he's he's 10 gold off of finishing it. Probably wants to get to yep. 16, 20 for a century. As soon as he clears this mid-wave, I, I want to see him back, spend that gold, and set up for Gold Fury. But I might have just lost wrong. Wrong, you unfortunately taken loan. That's going to be SSG's first kill of this one. It goes to Raffer, but Dardez is able to find himself an assist on that one. So wrong you, so impactful in this early game. Does catch his first death. It is Soul Reaver finished up for Shinto and went Divine Ruin first overall, as well as into the blue boots there in the mid lane. So, so you talk about early, powerful, spiky itemization. Shinto's got it in spades. Yeah, this is this is a really strong point for Shinto. And losing wrong you there delays your Gold Fury pull a little bit. But I don't think it should end it. it looks like Space Station is going to try it, but this should be Sanguine ecstatic that there's people here. Shinto moves in. Space Station Gaming realized that, and Gold Fury will be reset at about half health. And that might be all she wrote for this engagement. Yeah, I, I agree, Agro. That, that's maybe wishful thinking there from SSG. Maybe that's just a... What, what do you call it? Kick the tires? Let's see if uh, anyone from Sanguine's nearby. See, see if that's they have right. any idea. See and, if anybody's uh, awake, you know, ring the doorbell, see if anyone answers, and uh, and then if they show up, that's fine. You, you just go about your way. But I'm surprised that Sanguine is so willing to, to play this slowly. Now that 1,000 gold lead is only 300. That's really yeah. that's really not anything at this point in the game. Experience is still pretty heavily in their favor, but that's mostly centered around Shinto. You've got power spike items completed across the board. Look at how many completed items are the last thing in Sanguine's inventory. Relic Dagger, Genji's Guard, Soul Reaver, Executioner. All those are just finished. Look at Space Station. A lot of Tier 1, Tier 2 items that aren't finished. This is where you are far stronger and you need to force fights. And they agree with you. And Sanguine are going to start up that Gold Fury with SSG close by. Panatom, the one closest to the Red Wall. But Sanguine's still slow playing this one. They want to back themselves off. And the Gold Fury is reset one more time. I, I kind of agree, Aggro. Surprising seeing how slow they're starting to play some of these early game fights. They don't have great secure, and that's the big concern, is that Uller has better secure than, than anybody on their side. Well, instead, maybe they'll press the gas pedal in the middle lane. Raffer has to burn the ultimate to get underneath the tier one tower. Vote doing his best to plug away some good damage, and Yarkor on that King Arthur will now be firmly in the mix as three members of SSG will plug down half health on about everyone on Sanguine. You could see the opening, but Raffer has that kind of get out of jail free card with the Kuzenbo ult, and no kills as a result. Yeah, that, that, like, it's a little surprised that that wasn't a kill right there. I don't think Shinto dropped enough damage right off the bat. I don't think they realized how squishy Rapper was because of the, the, the item lead that Sanguine has. Would have liked to see them all in commit to that a little bit earlier. Shinto's a little bit late on his purification beads there, which means he takes way more damage than he really wants to. Nika does have the World Serpent. He's going to be under duress. Might have to charge it. Here it is. A tier one tower dive. Instead, he's going to use his Aegis and never even attempts to use the ultimate. Panatom on a killing spree. Three kills in this game. Wow. Cheerio looking for more. Will not find anything. And all said and done, Sanguine at least grabbed themselves one. Yarkor pulls tower aggro. Cheerio turns oh. around to kill. They're not going to finish it off. Sanguine, they give one right on back as Cheerio snacks his first kill of the game. And Yarkor is in a Wait, world he's got of trouble right now. Minions he's got to deal with. I don't know. He's got enough alt charge to full art Cherio. Oh. But yeah, it's just going to be a sacred monkey. A little poop on the nose. He's going to finish off Yarkor. Now Netrioid in a bad spot. Netrioid has to airstrike away as well. It looked like Sanguine maybe had the right idea with a kill on Tanika. Give a couple back, but Space Station Gaming have found themselves an opening. Shinto stunned down, has to burn the Aegis, but it won't save him this time. Rapper 
for his second kill of the game, wrong you. A nice double knock up and dash away, but he's only underneath this tier one tower in this mid lane. Tower dive could be on with a full collapse. Wrong you blinks backwards, and it seems like for the moment that'll get him out alive. So it is a one for none on this left side skirmish. And somehow Space Station's now in the lead. Just so weird across the map there by Sanguin. And Rongyu's actually going to take them Whoa. over towards Fire Giant. Oh, they could have pulled Big Fire. Dave, I thought this was going to be one of the best calls I've ever seen in my life. And they just, without Cheeto there, they can't pull Big Fire. And they make the right call. They wouldn't have had the damage. That would have been the smartest thing I've ever seen where if Shinto was up. It's still incredibly smart. They yes. get Pyromancer, they get something. They get something. But man, would that have been so sick if they had gone big FG. I don't think they would have had the damage to complete it though. I think they make the right call right. to just take the same one. Oh, I was so ready for it. I was getting amped up. I, I was ready for the FG and it won't end up being for saying when they do get the Pyromancer, as you point out, it, it, and don't scratch your eyes. You're looking at that gold differential after a, a 4 5 0 start for Sanguine, SSG, about 3,000 gold in the lead here in this game. And a lot of that on Cherry. I mean, you look at that kind of two man attempted tower dive from Sanguine, and then, and then a skirmish on the left side jungle, and then a secured Gold Fury. That is a, a massive swing in SSG's favor. There still is some scaling, though, for Sanguine, I think, that Space Station need to be worried about going into this late game. Yeah, the late game for Sanguine is certainly strong, but but Space Stations is as well. I, man, I just feel like they really dropped the ball on not playing around Shinto and how big he was in that mid game. Really a, a huge lead for him. He was in a great spot to just carry this game, and then Sanguine just felt a little bit gun shy around this Gold Fury. Then the engagement on the right hand side, Nika baits in Panatom, but never it never uses ultimate. Tries to to survive without it and just use the Aegis because he knows as soon as he ults that engagement's over. And Cherio eventually gets both kills though. It was awfully close to the point where it, it really should have just been Sanguine backing up. Yep. I, I, I don't know. I just feel like they had this opportunity to, to do a lot with that lead that Shinto had. That is an attempted gank onto Netrioid, but Jingwei ever oh, safe weird. will be able to airstrike out and away. Cherio did use the Fear No Evil as well, so now with some yeah. potential skirmishing happening in this left side jungle, an ultimate for Sangwa down, an ultimate for SSG down, and, and pointed out by Doug there, Cherio is going to pick up the Prid win. So Weird. if you want to use those ults early and often, I guess that's a, ne a neat item to have. Yeah, I mean, this is this is an odd choice for Cherio for sure, because Prid win's an item that scales based on your total protections. So that's how big the shield gets, and he's obviously in the build, he's only got 60 uh, for, from Pridwin itself, though you have to keep in mind that you're also getting your natural protection. So this is going to be, if I had to, yeah, so you got about 100 physical defense, which is really more than I thought he'd have with just that, but you get some pretty decent scaling there. So you're, you're with the Sov prot buff that the Rapper has that he's getting, that's like a 200-ish health shield that's also giving you 200 damage whenever it pops. It's going to slow the enemy. Might not matter if they have beads, but it's adding 200 damage and it's 20% CDR. It's not, it's not horrible, I guess. It's just right. a little bit odd. It's curious, and we'll have to see if Cherio can forge that into some success here. And, and worth checking in on. There's another fear no evil drop down by Cherio, but Netroid is or, or Panatom rather will be able to get himself out of this fight. So. As I figured he might, Cherio looking for those engagements early and often. Raffer burns Kuzumbo ult as well, but still no kills on the board. This one has slowed way down here in the last few minutes. Aggro after what, four or five kills in the first five minutes. It's really been the, the threat of this hunt bat stopping Sanguine from, from being aggressive. And it's also the fact that Raffer's playing Kuzumbo, which is just a god that's really, really hard to kill at any point in the game. He's got lots of mobility. You're doing damage to yourself while killing him, which never feels particularly good. And then he's going to use that ultimate, which is a long duration CC immune ultimate that displaces you, moves him around the map pretty quickly. Right. It's just tough to, to knock him down. And especially with this level lead that Raffer has, he's up three levels on Rongyu right now, which, which is really quite a bit. Normally supports are willing to be about a level or two down to their opposition if they're trying to funnel farm into the right area, get Shinto ahead like Sangwood did early on, but at this point, you don't really want to be only level 12 against a bunch of level right. 18s and 19s on the other side. 
I'm curious, Agro, and we've seen, I would say, a wide smattering of builds, honestly, in the Hunter role here as of late. And Doug pointing out another Prid one locked down for Raffer. But I think Jing Wei's have felt maybe a little bit more comfortable moving into to one or two crit items. Netrioid picking up the Rage and then and then likely a Wind Demon after that. Maybe back to that in a moment as Raffer will have to make use of that Prid when he's going to get himself out alive. But do you like kind of that, that double crit itemization that a lot of Jing Wei players have started going for? I don't mind it, but it is spooky against a Kuzinbo. And, and especially, I like it against Yorm because even with Spectral, he's a lot less tanky than most of their solo laners. Against a Kuzumbo with Thorns, it scares me because you're going to kill yourself really, really <laughs> quickly. I don't even know if Raffer's going to build Spectral because he might want Netrioid to take as much damage as humanly possible off of that Thorns and, and Shell Spikes combo. Well, after a bit of stagnation here in the mid game, we might be starting to see an engagement around this Gold Fury. I think that will give us a good idea of maybe where things stand. SSG is still about 3,000 gold in the lead, so at least gold wise. Things are in their favor. Sanguine are going to pull out the Fury here, but step themselves back. And the dance will continue. Who do you look to maybe engage here? You think it's going to be Panton, but he just lost his Purification Beats, which is a big deal. So that's going to be your guide to try and get in there and get his hands dirty. They'll be up fairly soon because of the Relic Dagger he's picked up. But I think that does put a big hamper on Sanguine's initiation. Whereas Space Station, you've got Han Bat's Blink Alt, you've got Raffer Blink. You've got Nika who could just pop that ultimate on a flank or, or try and find a knockup like this. When well, Panatom was out of range just for a moment, but I think luckily for Sanguine, SSG didn't realize. Fury pulled one more time. Yarkor in. Panatom leaps over the wall in the back line. A fear no evil. Catches onto three members of Sanguine and Rapper now zoning out. All four members of Sanguine that want to try to re-engage. Nika will take to the World Serpent and find a couple knockups, but he just disengages to go back to the rest of SSG. Two ultimates down for SSG, almost five ready to go for Sanguine. Yarkor moves in, Sanguine wow. take away the Oni Fury. The engagement is back from Sanguine. Nika caught a bit in the middle, but they're too low to fully re-engage. Cheerio agrees with that statement as well. He'll leap out, but Dardes finds the kill on the Shinto. You lose the Fury, but you might win the fight. It's a one for none, but Sanguine take the Fury away. Sanguine make a big play. I don't know if that was Shinto with a Frostbolt or Rongyu who dunks it down with that to the skies, but getting that Oni Fury a win for Sanguine, but it almost baits them because they start to feel a little bit empowered by that win. And you could tell that they kind of wanted to be stepping forward, but their 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 decision making was being stopped by their brains saying, "Hey, their carries are awfully healthy. Our health bars are a little bit low." We've already used some key some key relics and some key positionings. Ooh. Maybe we should be backing up, but it's oh we got Cold Fury, you know, we can we could keep going. They right. only lose Shinto, so it could be a lot worse. But Sanguine uh, maybe let the moment get the better of them a little bit there. Well, SSG push that advantage, the one man advantage a little bit further and take away the Pyromancer Gold or Fire Giant rather being positioned around by SSG. But realizing that Shinto will be back shortly, maybe this is just a chance to move forward, grab themselves some ward coverage, because, uh, you know, as long and drawn out of a dance as we saw around that the Oni Fury aggro, the, uh, the Fire Giant, I think, will be a tense moment for both of these teams as well. It's just a lack of secure on both sides. We've seen Sanguine not want to pull Gold Furies because of the, the fear of getting it stolen. We just watched Space Station get That's an right. Oni Fury stolen away. These are two teams that, that just don't have great objective secure. Now, Sanguine's got great objective burn because of Merlin, especially with that Spear of the Magus, which yep. really is there to help on objectives more than the other players. Engagement onto Dardes, who has to leap away, but Panatom is there to apply a little bit of poison. The Aegis is up, and it won't be enough to save his life. Panatom has found a kill onto the SSG Hunter. Vote is going to make his way out, has to use the disengage, but Yarkor is right there to follow up. Two kills so far for Sanguine. They're going to want some extra Nika. Just slithers away thanks to that World Serpent. It's a two for none. Sanguine maybe now turn their eyes towards the FG. Such a perfect engage by Sanguine. It's all wrong you, man. I mean, he finds the, he finds Dardes through the trees and then is able to get on top of Boat with that all. Hey, it's easier to secure the Fire Giant if no one is left alive to steal it away from you. Rapper overstays this one a little bit too long. You're no longer a welcome guest, say Sanguine. Nika. No World Serpent to get out alive. Four members ultimately fall now for SSG. 
and the Fire Giant will be restarted once again, but Cheerio is hanging close by. Got that ultimate coming up soon. Blink still available as well, but he's getting hunted. Run now by Yarkor and Panatov. Cherio's trying to make the hero play, but won't even get a chance to use it. Easy Fire Giant for Sanguine. And I want to point out, Doug brought up the team fight recap after that little skirmish on the right-hand side where both Vote and Dardes fell. Space Station had more damage. It's just that Sanguine is hitting yep. the same targets all the time. The, 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 whoever is their primary shot caller has everyone on a leash, basically, and it's working perfectly for this team. And this is where I'm, I get scared for, for Space Station, really any team that, that loses a Fire Giant to Sanguine, loses a big team fight, they get five for zero there. 26 to 40-ish on that Fire Giant. I wonder if they're gonna end it before this fire even comes off of them, because that's what they usually do to teams. And, and you know, as discrepant as this game has been, remember Space Station Gaming had the largest gold lead of this game at about three, 4,000, not five minutes ago. But you look at the, these non-respawning objectives still that Sanguine have to take. Uh, it's tier one towers, uh, three tier two towers, one tier one in the middle lane. This gold differential is going to continue to build for Sanguine. Might get a little bit wider as Rapper has come to play, but Sanguine are having none of it. Rapper has to get himself out alive, and it's the Pridwin this time. Maybe some extra shielding that keeps him alive there, but it's still a tier two tower that Sanguine looked free to take. And Panatom uses ultimate, but that's no big deal. He's got 40% CDR. That's not a concern. There's a lot of towers on the map, and Sanguine not trying to go for that Phoenix is very, very smart. Their gold lead is not substantial at this point. Let's just get all this gold off the map and make sure that we are really far ahead before we start pushing for the end. This tier one tower finally falling 28 minutes into this game. Sanguine out ahead of that one. So you have a Jingwei with a fully stacked rage now and she will be hitting plenty hard. No spectral armor just yet on this spectral armor watch. Tier two tower under duress here now in the mid lane. Panatom just working close by, back behind. He has felt free and clear to dive the back line and try to get himself out afterwards. I think SSG just showing some face around that tier two tower. I think smartly not re-engaging. Wonder what the game plan is here from Sanguine because they're gonna have a lot of gold in hand. Doug already has it up. This is gonna bring everybody pretty close to 2K in hand. Ooh, they wanna just reset after this, go get this tier two, go to Gold Fury, get that Primal Fury down and, and then reset for another firefight or they gonna try and push for a Phoenix without spending any of this gold. I think it's a pretty tough call. I think the safe, I mean the safer call, no doubt, is that they just back and spend this gold and, and try and win a fight straight up. Yeah, safe is going by the wayside here as Rongyu has blinked underneath the right side tier two tower this time. Methodical maybe from Sanguine just to clear the map of all towers. Panatom has found Dardes again, but the actives will save the hunter's life just for a moment. Panatom. Gets taken down a little bit low, and Yarkor has moved himself into the mid-game. The rest of Sanguine just chipping away at this tower. Rapper doing his best to play Separator, and has actually dragged one back, but Rongyu dashes out. Shinto finishes off the kill onto the SSG Guardian. Nika takes to the ground, and ultimately it is a Tier 2 tower and one kill for Sanguine, and somehow all five members make it out alive. But Agro, they might stick around and look for more. It looks like it. They know no alts are up on Space Station. Dart has no relics at all. Shinto has both his relics, as does Netrioid. It's risky, but not as risky as it looks, I don't think. I wouldn't mind them staying for this, but they only have one more wave to do it. The Fire Giant falling off in 20 seconds. May as well just strip the jungle and go for this Primal Fury instead. I think this is just fine. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind that at all. I, I think that's a maybe a decision-making call, and we looked at it yesterday, and, you know, we don't want to bring it up too heavily, but but we've seen games kind of lost at questionable decision makings to stick around underneath those phoenixes, try to end the game, oh, yeah. and maybe you can play a little bit more safe. So I think Sanguine, ultimately, they're, they're playing that safe route. The, the Fire Giant buff falls off. Now let's get the Primal Fury. It'll help us out with the next Fire Giant, spend our gold, and then maybe get Fire Giant and end after that. Yeah, this is going to be 3k in hand for most players. I mean, this is, this is full items. Not quite selling your boots, but this is power pot territory, you know, gra grab that extra little bit of power and set yourself up to just go and win the game. Up I mean, Shinto just got to finish the Obsidian Shard, upgrade both his relics, and get a power pot all at the same time. I mean, that is a <laughs> huge power spike for him. And now, even if this game doesn't end right here, you can Shinto can afford to play a little bit more aggressively because he has those relics upgraded 
think Space yep. Station did a good job of, of keeping themselves in this game, despite Sanguine getting that delayed D aside and, and grabbing that Fire Giant, but it didn't come for free. They lost everything on the map besides those Phoenixes. Absolutely. Fire Giant right back up. There is some shallow ward coverage for SSG as Fire Giant springs from the earth once again. Sanguine have secured the one and only Fire Giant so far in this game, and for the moment, even potentially just looking for a fight. They do have enough damage. They have started the Fire Giant, Sanguine have, so they're gonna send Rong Yu and Yarkor forward just to play zone. As it's like Netrioid is just gonna try to solo this thing all on his own. Cherio realizing this moves his way in. Yarkor knocks up Cherio. Down goes to Fear No Evil, but it's only caught onto one. Rapper taken low. Fire Giant reset. Penatom, okay. Rapper goes down. It's a four versus five, and they're looking for the re-engage. Rongyu has brought Sanguine back into the fray. It's a double kill now for Panatom. Three members left screaming from SSG. Yarkor knocks down Dardes. Might even find himself a double. Cherio, no fear, no evil. A double kill for Yarkor, a double kill for Panatom. And Aggro, I think that might just be the game. Five for zero, and Sanguine doesn't even break a sweat. Shito just waiting for the boys to take care of the Phoenix for him. But man, what an impressive game from Sanguine. I think that they, they lost themselves in the mid game a little bit, but for my money, Sanguine is really good at this stage of the game. I think they're great in the five on five team fights. I think the weakest part of their game so far has really been that early game, but yeah. they've really managed to play around that nicely and get past those early game struggles sometimes. That early game went as well as could possibly go yeah. They dropped it off a little bit in the mid game, but if you get to 35, 40 minutes against Sanguine, good luck, man, because they, lo they look so, so good in those moments. It, if yeah. they had Space Station played like a fiddle, I mean, Space Station couldn't go anywhere without Sanguine knowing exactly where they were, and they couldn't decide the terms of that engagement at all. Yep. They were all playing on Sanguine's terms right there, and Sanguine cleaned them up easily. And I love the call there, realizing Netrioid has enough damage just to solo the Fire Giant on his own. It's either you're going to have to come into us and contest, or we're going to fight you on your own terms, take take the Fire Giant. I think a great call there from Sanguine. I am right. curious, though, if, if maybe more teams start to try to punish Sanguine early, because I feel like a lot of their success has been in that early game. Yeah, I think that that has to be where you have to look at the Sanguine team. I mean, even in, in previous years in the minor league, if they got you to late game, they were winning most of those games. It's the games where they got steamrolled early on that gave them trouble. And a quick note about that build for Netrioid, no one else is building as much crit as him. It's because of that build that he's able to play that play style and try and yep. solo that Fire Giant. And Sanguine's playing around it really well. It's not just for the enemy players. It's the way that they play these objective fights. Netrioid kind of has to build that way. And then they play around it so well. We figured this one would be a lot of fun to watch, and somehow that still feels like an understatement after game number one. Sanguine swing first, and they connect. They grab a 1-0 lead here in our first set of the day on Saturday. But Agro and I are done talking about this one. We'll get it back to Finch and Miff to break it down. Thank you, Dolson and Agro. That is a big game one, and big games deserve big skins. I want to remind you all about Totem Caller, Ho Yi, the unlimited tier 5 Ho Yi skins available right now. If you go click buy all in the Grim Omens event, you can also get 15 exclusive skins, three other unlimited reward skins, and more content when you buy all. That sounds pretty good to me. And you know what else sounds pretty good to me, Mifflin? Starting off your setup against Space Station 1 0 oh, in favor of Sanguine here, man. I mean, that, that that's a crazy start to this game. It's Starts off with Vote kind of getting body over over there in lane. It, it, it starts off with 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 them getting off to such an early lead, and it looked like there was no way Sanguine was going to be able to drop it. But then the game gets way more competitive and starts to move on. And, and it was all these throws back and forth. Miff, try and go back through and give me a thread to follow throughout that game. All right, I'm going to break down the entire game in a hundred or less words <laughs> right now. Sang would get off to a fantastic start, 4-0, as you pointed out. But immediately, it seemed like Sanguine was trying too hard to push the lead in that long lane. Rapper immediately dipped out of there and started splitting up the farm, and it got them back in the match. Despite being 5-1 and one at 10 minutes, the gold lead was completely shattered. Around the 15-minute mark, we saw that SSG just pulled ahead. And then from there, it was all SSG until about that 25-minute mark around that Fire Giant fight where Sanguine win wholeheartedly, get a stagger pick on the entirety of SSG's comp, get the Fire Giant, and then from there, it was all Sanguine, and they never dropped it again. I mean, yes, it was a tumultuous set, but Sanguine showed that they can win the early game, and despite 
falling apart for the most part, can bring it back in the late. As Agro said, these guys, you can't let them get to that late game mark. And to me, a lot of this was wrong, you Mifflin. Look at these early game clips, right? I mean, yeah, this is this Netroid finding big shots, but it's Horus brings so much pressure just with one or two abilities in lane. We were talking about how you don't normally think of Jingwei as this pressure pick, but when Horus has this lockdown into the persistent gust, there's just no way that you're going to be able to make out of it. And then when they got into the late game, it was all about his to the skies and how well he used it. It helped to set up for that Gold Fury steal. That's what set up for that fight they lost in right after Space Station pushed the Tier 1 tower around the FG and then the Horus ultimate came over. They suddenly closed the gap. That's what sealed the game at the end as well. After they got their pick on the Raffer, I believe, they pushed forward and were able to find that kill over in right too. I really think the Horus pick was the hero of this set. And it's so surprising that do we see Sanguine pick up Horus immediately. Yes, Horus got that buff on his ultimate that makes it a fantastic utility tool and now be able to move further and faster. But you don't often see teams adapt to those sort of meta changes as quickly. Sanguine proving that they play Smite 24-7, they're already fully adept at playing around this Horus. You're exactly right, man. They came with it ready. And remember who the beneficiary ended up being, Mifflin, of that early game start for Sanguine? It really wasn't even Netroid, despite him being the one that kind of bodied in lane. It was really Shinto, right? Shinto was the one that got to like a three or four level lead over Vote. And I want to talk about how about how Space Season responded to it as well. They did that role swap. They brought Vote over towards mid. They let him get a little bit more farm back. They, they brought Dardes over to Long Lane, let him go even up against Netroid and try and buy them some time. And I think it actually really worked. They were able to bring the game back pretty close to parity it just didn't end up being enough that roll swap really was the only option they had they couldn't leave them over there to the wolves in the long lane and once they did switch <laughs> off they did a fantastic job ssg that is of splitting up the farm yeah i mean vote did get picked out one more time in middle but after that it was just farming constantly he didn't get involved in any of those early game fights and immediately closed up that level gap I imagine we see ssg shift their focus and try not to get 4-0 easy swept in the first three minutes of this game no, it's a brutal start, man, to that game for them, and Sanguine capitalized on it, though it looked like they might let it slip away for a bit. And I gotta wonder, man, if this is gonna be a kind of sort of I don't, wake up call feels like the right word, right? But this is gonna put Space Station on notice, I think. You cannot take this Sanguine roster for granted. It's, for me, there were two options either obey are a bit worse than we thought, and the Sanguine win doesn't mean as much as we thought, or Sanguine are just better than we had thought. And I think right now, I'm leaning towards Sanguine might be better than we gave them credit for. I mean, they took out SSG one game in the set so far, but that is monumentous. That is huge. It completely shakes my understanding of the standings in the league. I thought SSG was going to be an uncontested top tier, but Sanguine coming out at the heels of the king and shooting up for the head, it's pretty nutty. Now they have to prove that SSG has to play around them. I imagine we don't see the Kuzumbo pick up from Rapper. Maybe we see some respect shown towards that Horus as well. We might see that picked out for oh, SSG boss. just to take it away. But Merlin, going to be picked up for Sanguine again. I mean, if it works, it works. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a run back so far. It's the Hell, Thor, Persephone from Space Station, the Kamazotsu Mocha, and the Shing Chen. Remember, Space Station banned the Aphrodite, I believe, and then one more after that. So so this is pretty much the same. They're going to get Shinto back onto this Merlin pick for Seng on the left side, and then Space Station are going to take this Jormungandr again. And I think this is worth talking about a bit, too. I don't think Nika particularly impressed me on this pick. There were some times where he held his ult forever, and I, and I just wasn't so sure why that was the calculation for him. I, how did you feel about the, about the performance of the okay, I'm not a huge fan of Jormungandr. I mean, you said it earlier, he is like as if you had picked Sun Wukong and hit the upgrade button slightly better, but for the most part, he is just looking to backline disrupt and stay there. even in lane. And I don't think that you want to stay even in lane, you want to pull ahead. If you do pick Jormungandr, it tells me that you trust the rest of your squad to just win the match elsewhere and you're going to hold your own in that lane, but it seems like SSG is going to need to pull ahead a little bit further, maybe rely on all of their parts. So. I would have liked to see him pick a more traditional warrior instead of this Jormungandr. Yeah, I think last time Yarkor ends up Just getting that King good. Arthur to go up against the Jormungandr. It's the Aphrodite, though. This time, remember, Space Station banned this in game one, so they clearly were valuing it. They were worried that Sanguine were going to take it, but Space Station elected to take it for themselves. And because we saw votes start in the long lane when they had the lower pressure pick, it does make me wonder. I think Aphrodite can do a bit better in the mid lane, so maybe she won't have to, want, won't, won't have to swap, but you kind of got to keep it in the back of your mind because Space Station are willing to do it. 
They are. And even if they do elect to put this Aphrodite in an off-roll spot, she could flex towards support. She could flex all over the map. We could even see Jorman Gondor go support and Aphrodite solo. So maybe SSG picks it up this early, not only because she is a fantastic pick uh, post-buffs, but she is a wow. decent flex. Kuzumbo coming out again, I'm not a huge fan. Rapper wasn't able to do much. Yeah, and I do want to talk about the Kuzumbo. I'm a bit surprised that Sanguine are letting the Unbots through again. They're banning the Kali and the Ganesh in that spot. And I don't know, man. I, I don't love letting Cheerio tend to pick one of the best assassins in the game twice in a row. But I agree about the Kuzumbo. I don't think Raffer got a ton of value out of it. I think it's part of why Vote got so rocked. Kuzumbo is not very much health in the early game. So I don't know, man. I, I don't love this pick for him, but I trust Raffer implicitly when it comes to playing Smite. The, the guy's a god. Yeah, I mean, questioning the king is hard to do. However, Rapper on this Kuzumo is telling me that it doesn't matter that last game didn't start off too well. Kuzumo is a god that you pick and you want to run with him from the minute one. He has to get this lead. A, a, a Kuzumo from behind isn't a Kuzumo. So I imagine we see some more aggressive play coming out of the early. Well, it's time to start with game number two. Thank you, Finch. Thank you, Mifflin. Sanguine strike first up against SSG. And the question we kind of had going into that breakdown aggro was, does SSG have the ability to change, swing first in this early game, get some momentum going for their side? I am curious, though. Sanguine, aside from the Susano, have been able to run back their game one composition. Space Station Gaming, again, aside from their jungler and now their mid laner, something very similar. D do you like the change or maybe lack of change that you've seen in th the pick ban phase here for both teams? Yes and no. There are things I like about Space Station and, and things that I wish they would have changed. First and foremost, I am floored that Rongyu got Horus again because I completely agree right. with what Finch is saying. <laughs> he was the catalyst for that game one. And, and Raffer has one of the best Horuses in the world. So I really thought that Space Station was going to pick Uller Horus top two. They stick to the Yorm. I'm just I'm just a little bit surprised by that. It feels like that's a, a difference in what they value in the support role. That this Kuzenbo for Raffer seems to be the call. But I do like they've given vote the Uller this time around. Clearly Dardes had a had a better time in this lane that than vote did. Low bar, but I think that just giving him a, a god that can that can fight early instead of that, right. that traditional mage and Raijin makes more sense. Well, I am not surprised at all that we've already seen Rong Yu use his blink, get into the back line, and just try to make this long lane as uncomfortable as possible. I mean, if you're SSG, anything better than, than dying three times three minutes into this game will, will be an improvement on game number one. And you know, I, I think while I, I totally agree, it, it's wild to me that, that Rong Yu gets Horus again and that Raffer is, is sticking with the Kuzumbo. I feel like the Kuzumbo found some early game presence there for SSG. The couple of kills that Space Station did have were on the back of Raffer. I agree. I agree. I think that, that Raffer did do a lot in that game, but it it's just that Rong Yu did so much that it, it's agree. taking it away and, and you're not losing a whole lot on your side, right? That, that That's the big thing for me. Oh, there is a dash forward knockup from Netrioid on Devote. The final shot is there. You've got to be kidding me. They've done it again. First blood two minutes in. Netrioid right onto the board. Vote back to base. Same story, different game. Dude, I, I just don't understand what... It, is Vote's beads button broken? Like, uh, look, the, the first... Game one, sure. You haven't played against this combo in a while, maybe. You don't really know how much damage you're going to take. Bro, he got rocked by this so many times in game one. It is inexcusable to hold the beads in that situation game two. You got to use them, man. Even if he even if he beads yeah. is the Jing Wei knockup and dodges the auto attack, <laughs> he lives there. He had three different CCs he could have beads and chose to hold them for next game. But look, man, hey, if there's game three, watch out because those beads are going to be up and ready to go because he's got them ready for game three. And, you know, it seems like maybe he's now back in respawn and Vote is maybe under the impression that the presence will be there early in Opta. I don't know. I'm trying to find a way to dance around uh, the lack of bead usage here. But but it's such a similar start. I mean, two less kills on the board at this point. But but it's wrong. You immediately helping Netroid get ahead. He'll return down to this long lane. And then at some point, I expect wrong you with this lead that he's built for himself to just bring it over to the mid lane and start to help some presence onto Dardes with maybe lack of mobility on the Aphrodite. So 
I love the way Sanguine have started this game, and that's sort of a self-answering question. SSG haven't stuck it to Sanguine just yet. No, n not at all. And again, Netrioid's doing the right thing, freezing this wave, forcing Vote to come up, and it pulls Raffer over here. This is going to make sure that Vote doesn't get solo farm or anything like that. And as soon as he, as soon as Raffer shows up, sure, we lost some kill potential. Now we have to worry about the CC and damage coming from the Kuzen bow. We'll hard push and, and go and get our Alpha Harpy and, and do something productive with our time. Use this duo pressure. Maybe we can go and get Oracles or, or contest Cherry right. on those at the very least. Th th this is how you play duo lane, man. Rangu and Netriot are putting on a clinic. And I do think it is worth mentioning. I brought up Dardes a little bit in that mid lane, Aphrodite. Uh, she's been a pick that a lot of pros and a lot of people in the community have talked about. Cherio has found a gank. Pow wow. Looking for a chain on an Etrioid. That one does connect, but the beads used by the Sanguine Hunter will keep him alive under the duress of a jungle gank. Panatom is here. We'll pull back Cherio. Dash maybe still on cooldown from Cherio. Down he goes. Netrioid second kill in the game. Four and a half minutes in. A little bit slower, but kills are flowing just the same. Trickster Spirit, a long, long cooldown, man. It, it yep. takes time for that to come back up, and Cherio just didn't have it in time. Raffer and Vote really can't do very much to stop Panatom, but man, I really thought Cherio was going to be out of range. That Wind Siphon felt like it pulled him from a mile away, but that's that's Susano, man. I mean, he displaces you. He, he has a lot of CC and a lot of mobility, and Panatom put it to good use there. And I wonder now what, what SSG are thinking. I mean, you're looking at a near mirror draft from what Sanguine had in game one, and a near mirror start to what we saw in game one. The, the kills spread out, at least this time. It's not all on one man. Uh, but maybe this is a good opportunity to kind of look at it. If you're SSG, maybe you realize where things went wrong in game one and can make some changes here for game two. But I, I haven't seen those quite yet, Agro. No, I don't think they've played around the, the way that Sanguine showed them they're going to play in game one particularly well. We're seeing Raffer come over to that left side more than he was last time. That is... Some sort of adjustment. Cherio spending more time ganking early than he did last time around. That also shows some willingness to change. But it, it's just not a, a composition here for Space Station that is super sick in the early game. I think they, they have really drafted a weaker early game composition than they had in game number one. Dodgy sure. is an assassin that takes a long time to get to the point where she's doing the things you want her to do. Everything she does scales at 100%. She's nuts come late game, but not super good early game. Aphrodite obviously is not going to be at her strongest in the early game where she needs a lot of cooldown and a lot of power to make her to make her heals really impactful. Another beads used by Sagwin, burnt down by Cherio. So Cherio certainly not shying away from looking for engagements, just hasn't found a successful one just yet. And I think that's an interesting pivot point. Agro, I, I have... I, I would hesitate to say I haven't seen a Susano yet, even in all the SEC, SOC games we've watched in this preseason. Uh, what makes Panatom reach for the Susano here? It, it's an interesting point because you're right. We haven't seen a whole lot of Susano, which I find kind of surprising. But he did take a nerf in Season 7 and, and is just one of those gods that in a competitive setting, it's much easier to lock down this mobile assassin than it is in your ranked game. Susano might be dominating when it comes to ranked and casual, but... It's really, really easy when there's little communication and you can just find your target and kill them instantly in the back line. His damage is quick, but it's not super instant. It, it is a lot right. of refires and you can interrupt him pretty easily during his ultimate or, or during his one, during his three. Th there's difficulties in getting that whole kit off in a competitive setting. And this time, Panatom probably goes for it because it's just a god that insta-kills Uller a lot of the time. Uller has a really hard time getting away from Susano because if you put that Wind Siphon on him, you set up for the Jet Stream, the Jet Stream sits on him, and you just wait until the Uller jumps away, and as soon as he does, you insta-kill him for it. You can force him to jump by using Typhoon, and even then Typhoon can still hit him if the timing is bad. It, it's just a pick that really bullies Hunters very well, and, and right. I don't blame Panatom for going for something that is going to put Vote even further behind because I'm sure Vote isn't feeling like he's playing his best right now. And if you right. can put him in that hole mentally, I think it's pretty easy to, to find a win here. It seems like any god that requires synergy is going to be great for Sanguine because they've got that in spades. And then, you know, I think even outside of just getting away from Susano, 
Uller uh, for Vote has had a tough time in this early game getting away from some of the duress in that long lane. It looks like the Gold Fury may be starting to be looked at here by both teams. I do like what I see out of SSG, though, Aggro. If you look at the, the ward coverage on the left side of that jungle, deep in the Sanguine side of things. So if nothing else, SSG, despite being about a, I don't know, call it 800 gold behind here, so not massive, do at least still have some good roaming map control, and they'll be able to sniff out Sanguine when this, fire, or when this Gold Fury, rather, maybe is going to get started up. This is not a, a, a horrible start for, for Space Station, all things considered. No Again, they're behind, but, but not by very much. But like I said at the end of game one, man, Sanguine being marginally ahead in the early game is a good spot for them to be in because I think their late <laughs> game is so, so good that just being in this position where you're not having to, where you are still in control of the pace of the game, where it's still up to you on where and when fights happen, I think Sanguine's in a great spot at this point. Space Station really, in my mind, is a team that could have just gone with brute force in the early game and really put Sanguine behind the yep. eight ball, but they didn't draft for that and they and they haven't gotten that in execution either. Watch out, Dardes. Wrong you is here to play. Afro taken low. There's maybe a slight lack of mobility playing into this gank. Dardes will dance back and get some healing as well. Panatom is here, but Cherio is going to be enough disengaged to make Sanguine think twice about moving forward. So uh, maybe what Aphrodite lacks in escape, she makes up for in a little self-sustain. I think Shinto just a little bit preemptive on using that Vortex, the, the Arcane 2 yep. to try and pull in Dardes. I think if he just waits for Rongyu to land that, to land that updraft and, and find the slow after the fact, that guarantees a kill. And Shinto kind of lets wrong you try and finish that kill off and because that that forces sanguine back after using a lot of resources netroid uses his ultimate on trying to get a purple buff defense this opens up a gold fury for space station and there is some of that vision maybe playing off space station gaming realizing that sanguine aren't close by to contest on that one so the gold pulled back now for ssg but i hesitate to even make that point you're looking at about 300 gold so if nothing else that about just evens up this game uh, do you think that's a maybe a sneaky call there from SSG to start up the, the Gold Fury, or, or is that more Sanguine maybe asleep at the wheel a little bit? Uh, it, it's it's Space Station making an opening, and Sanguine probably goes, they could be on Gold, but we can't really stop it at this point, right. so let's just hope they aren't. That's kind of your game plan at that point. Having used Rongyu's ultimate, Shinto took a little bit of poke, Panatom took a little bit of poke, Netrioid invaded purple and, and had to ult out in order to stay safe. That's a lot of resets that have to happen for Sanguine. And Space Station just intelligent and in using their sustain that they have in their kits and just understanding the the map, the macro of the map, knowing right. that Sanguine's gonna have to reset or come in at a disadvantageous fight, they're fine to pull that either way. And I think a smart call there for SSG and maybe even Sanguine to realize that was not a winning fight for them on their end. So all is held equal here about 11 minutes in and, and slower. I think anything would have been slower from what we saw in game one. Sanguine did still strike for a couple of kills early in this game. And I sort of look towards that mid lane. We've had conversation about Aphrodite and I think I always have to bring up a rod of Tahuti when it's picked up. I mean, that is a, a massive, just magical power spike to pick up for a first item overall. Rapper might need some help from that rod of Tahuti. Not going to happen this time, but but Darda is opting for for an early large power spike on that Aphrodite, and I love it on Afro. It's it's a little bit bad. It feels a little bit bad to not go for as much cooldown as early as possible to not get Chronos pen in that slot. But this passive is nuts because of this below 50% health threshold. It's great for Afro. It means that her lovebirds, if they start ticking you when it's below 50%, now they're going to do a lot more damage. That back off if Cherio goes in. It gets you below 50%. That back off feels almost like an execute at times. Yep. But it also works if she's healing someone on her team below 50%. Those heals are 25% stronger. It goes both ways. So this is a very, very strong item on Aphrodite. And it feels a little bit rough to spend this much gold early on. But to have it for the whole game from this point out and not have to save up for it right. later is so, so good. And it feels like you're going to end up in a much stronger point. I think that does also open the door. Shinto prioritizing that Divine Ruin first overall. 
Still more engagements in this mid lane here as Rapper will lock down wrong you, but safe enough to get out alive for Sanguine. And I got to admit, Aggro, I mean, despite two kills on the board for Sanguine, I mean, really gold and XP is maybe where you have to look. It sort of feels like SSG are kind of in the driver's seat on this one. It's, you know, Sanguine absolutely still in this game. Nothing is over just yet, but you look at kind of map pressure and map presence. Just to me, it feels like SSG are the ones kind of calling the shots. Agreed, and their composition scales so well come late game that it's going to be pretty easy for them to continue to do just that. Watch out, Rongyu wants to join the fight and he does that. Raffer takes to the ultimate and will get out alive. Sanguine looking to re-engage on, on what maybe would have been an opening on SSG, but nothing as a result. So, so right as we say it, that certainly shows that Sanguine are not going to shy away from a fight, especially when they found maybe a member or two of SSG a bit caught out. But as soon as Rapper's under any sort of danger, you've got Dardos right there. He's positioned <laughs> right. perfectly, far away from the fight. No way anything can hit him, but close enough that that link hasn't broken at any point. I mean, it's just so hard to play around Afro, man. I mean, she just does everything. It's not like she's super low in, in damage anymore. I mean, her damage is now much more confirmable. She clears fairly well in the early game, and she still has this late game that feels so, so difficult to play against. I think Sanguine's going to have a tough time against it. Cherio continuing to look for aggression. And I kind of, you know, I, I just mentioned prior to some of that mid-fight, Shinto opting for that Divine Ruin first overall again. That's not super surprising. Uh, but remember, he went Soul Reaver, I guess technically second completed item overall. Uh, but Ethereal Staff locked down for Shinto's second overall here. What, what's maybe his thought process there? Yeah, I'm surprised that he's willing to switch it up. I mean, he went E-Staff last game, but maybe he just felt like that he wasn't as far ahead and, and couldn't afford the more expensive item at this point in the game would be would be my best guess. Maybe he wants to steal some health from that Aphrodite and make her easier to kill. It's it's small window, but maybe that ends up right. making Panatom or, or Netrioid have an easier time killing that Afro if you can, you can hit him with an E-Staff proc. I'd imagine it's the cost more than anything else, though, and maybe the little bit of health as well. Cherio's on a, on a pretty effective dive character in Daji this time around, so maybe he just wants that extra HP that Soul Reaver couldn't have provided. And we've seen Cherio, you point him out, engaging early and often here in this game, and hasn't found really anything at all for his efforts. And I almost... It, waiting in bated breath aggro for when these solo laners start to rotate over into a lot of these fights, because that's really where we saw some some big explosions in game one, right? I mean, Nika maybe uh, found found some openings in the fights here and there, but I, I look at Yarkor down the stretch in game number one on this King Arthur. Once those rotations into the big sweeping team fights started, granted there haven't been any yet in this game, I feel like that's where Sanguine were able to, to even further their advantage in game number one. Completely agree. I didn't get a really a chance to, to talk about it as much as I wanted to, but Yarkor had a really, really strong game one because he was consistently forcing Cherio to use those Fear No Evils to separate him from the team fights, but still creating so much space, forcing Fear No Evil onto himself and always surviving through it. He picked up Purification Beads at level 12 last time around. We'll see what he decides to go for this time. Uh, looks like it was Purification Beads that have already been used. So you you mm -hmm. can expect the same sort of thing where Yarkor is going to be pretty free to dive in the early in, in the mid to late game and not be too threatened by the CC from Cherio. And that's what we expect and maybe hope to see from Yarkor because I don't know, I, I love watching a good King Arthur. There, there's just something like it, it almost feels this is oversimplifying. It almost feels like button mashy to a point, but like calculated button mashing, you know? And would you say, about watching. Dave, would you fair and say that, that you kind of enter the flow state when you're playing King Arthur? Like, right, you, you your eyes your go eyes blank. And, right. And you're, <laughs> yeah, you've entered, you, you've ascended to a different plane when you're playing King right. Arthur. That's, that's the best part of Arthur is when you hit that flow state for sure. I agree. And everything just starts, starts hitting. And Yarkor is one of those guys that we've seen certainly can make the King Arthur look Pretty darn good, and SSG are going to think that this Oni Fury looks pretty good, and they're going to take it away. Nobody from Sanguine one more time in range to contest on the Fury. Panatom was looking for a pullback, connects just onto the wall there, and now suddenly Space Station Gaming have found an opening to fight. Panatom deleted by vote. Nika has found the World Serpent as well. One more crash down onto Netrioid, but the Aegis is used. Not sure the damage was there from Nika anyway. It's a two-front fight here as Yarkor has found 
couple of the squishy members of Space Station Gaming, and he's doing a pretty good job Whoa. of locking a few of them in. The pull back from Shinto is going to set up a kill for Yarkor. Then Sanguine want more. That's the ultimate. Down on to Dardes. Rongyu is here playing frontline. It's a two-man show for Sanguine as the escape is back from SSG. Watch out. Shinto in on the rotation. Could be a big difference maker here. Beads by vote will prevent him from being pulled back through. He's going to plug away some good damage. Sanguine, two members back on the back pedal. Yarkor still in the <laughs> thick of things. No kills just yet. You've got to be kidding me. Pyromancer on the opposite side of the map. Locked down, Nika beneath his tier one tower. Wrong you, dashes away. Oh my goodness, how there are no kills in that engagement. I couldn't tell you. Yarkor is in that flow state for sure. Aphrodite, by the way. Dardes keeps everyone <laughs> alive. That is a ton of player damage at this point in the game to get through. 6k healing for Dardes. But what a fight by Yarkor and Shinto. I mean, Shinto goes really, really aggressive in the middle of that. He actually flickered in and got a big change dance off. That forced votes beads. Shinto did so much player damage, found a huge arcane combo by the Alpha Harpy on their side of the map, but it's all because everyone is paying so much attention to Yarkor. And if there's one weakness to the Aphrodite compositions that yes, she has good damage, but it's not very sustainable. You're kind of just getting it as, you know, you're not you're not chipping someone down. It's it's all back off here, back off here back off here you know it's bursts of 350 400 right. damage and without a soul reaver there for dardes he's making sure the yarkor has really no threat whatsoever especially with runic shield he's reducing that power reducing that healing dardes can't really afford to be trying to, to land lovebirds all the time or land those kisses because he's just juggling so many different balls on his side trying to make sure that everyone on space station staying alive that was impressive from really both sides yep. for there to be a, a, a big lack of kills. But Netrioid, instead of joining the fight, goes for the objective, gets some farm for himself. That was very, very smart. And as long as Panatom can recognize now that he has to really respect where Raffer is because that disruption by that watery grave was impossible for Panatom to really play around. He got insta-killed in that fight, and that fight still went well for Sanguine somehow. I am curious, though, if you're Sanguine, you watch something like that, Yarkor is just swinging away on three, four members of SSG the entire time. I wonder if that maybe opens your eyes and makes you think, and, and a lot of it extended, as you pointed out, because of Dardes. I, I almost wonder now, if you're on Sanguine, you feel like you have to prioritize anti-heal, where, where you know, maybe you had a Divine Ruin up to this point on Shinto. Maybe some other guys on Sanguine are now thinking, all right, that one went a little bit too long. Shouldn't have been that even. Maybe let's get some anti-heal online for ourselves. Yeah, no cursed Ankh is the is the real shocker to me. I thought Rongi, once he hit level 12, would be picking up an Ankh for sure. But no Ankh for him. No Contagion or Pestilence either for, for Yarkor or Rongi at this point. Right. Which is very, very surprising. They need more anti-heal for sure. And they're not getting it from Yarkor. He's building in what probably is going to be a Void Shield. Looks like Rongyu isn't going to be going in either. Contagion builds out of that breastplate tree, not out of this tree. So this is going to be a, a Midgardian male or a Sovereignty or something like that. I think Sanguine could use some more anti-heal at this point for sure. They they need more than just Divine and Brawlers. I mean, imagine how much value Yarkor would have gotten there out of a Pestilence or out of a Contagion. Right. <laughs> that would have been so much effective anti-heal throughout the course of that fight. I, I'm standing in, in between four members of SSG for extended periods of time and also stalling the, the massive amount of healing they're receiving. There is still a slot for Rong Yu to, to maybe pick up some anti-heal with his final item, but unfortunately all relics locked in. Mid-tier 1 tower, though, has been poked away by a few Nene Kappas thanks to Raffer tossing them in and maybe consider that one down, saying we're just trying to extend the time. But... You know, a continued look at builds here, Aggro, it is much the same from Netrioid, and I don't think he's felt the threat. I mean, it's still Rapper, of course, on that Kuzumbo. But, you know, if he's swinging away at Nika, there's no Spectral Armor on him as well. Netrioid, I think, has felt relatively safe going for these final three crit items, opting maybe for one more once that Hunter's Blessing goes down. I think so much of it is how it opens him up to, to solo objectives by himself and not need any help yeah. and let his entire team oh, zone. Like Look this. at this. He <laughs> finishes Wind Demon and immediately heads towards fire and just tries it out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But we can just try, and, and you don't lose a whole lot of HP for it. Cherio is going to try to engage here. 
did connect on one chain, but that's beads burnt by Shinto, and Wrong Yu will channel that ultimate, moving himself back and forth, but just a sidestep will result there for Wrong Yu. So ultimate for ultimate, but it's Palau in exchange for the uh, the dropship, as you will, for Wrong Yu. But continued and aggression from though from Cheria. That's right. Yeah, you're Shin right. Shinto used the beads as well, which is which is pretty key. Poor Rong Yu kind of walks in, is like, "Hey guys, are we fighting in here? Oh, I got ulti right away." He kind of shows up right at the right at the wrong time in order to get hit by that ult, and that's a great play by Cherio because he has full CDR between his his Jotuns, his Hydras, and his Arendite, and this is going to allow him to to immediately get value out of that ultimate again as soon as it's up, knowing that Shinto has no beads. I'll talk about a respawning objective that Sanguine can secure. The Fury is certainly one of them. Nice double knock up there from Panatom. Sanguine knocks down the Primal Fury. Yarkor right back into the thick of things. This time results in an easy kill. Down onto Cherio, whose ultimate had just respawned. Nika down through that World Serpent. Will jump himself up and down, but Rapper knocked down by Shinto. It's a two for none and a Fury for Sanguine. It's just that Sanguine feels like they're breaking all the unwritten like, so many SPL teams would be saying, okay, well, we they know we're doing gold here, so we maybe we shouldn't just try and full pull it at this point. But Nedroid just walks up and starts auto-attacking it and lets everybody else do all the zoning work for him. Nedroid is just the objective killer at this point. Everyone else doesn't have to worry about it. His fire giant pulled Nedroid almost completely as close as he was to being able to solo that in the last game. Ultimates traded out three members of Sanguine, suddenly drop shipped back onto Dardes, who will use the ultimate to stay CC immune there and backs himself away from Shinto, who is looking for the engage. Fire Giant started up one more time. Three, now five members of SSG on the map. Instead, it's going to be the Pyromancer. Look, that vote in range will plug away some damage, but Sanguine locks it down. I realize the, the door had closed on Fire Giant. Let's just take Pyro and stay alive. That's still risky, though, by vote. I mean, he was stepping up there with no relics. He's a little bit lucky, I think, that Ronkyu didn't just start walking at him. Didn't know exactly where everybody else was from Space Station. Probably thought that Dardes and Nika were coming on the flank instead of just clearing blue buff in order to give that over to Dardes. But Sanguine is playing this as they usually do, but you see this composition coming together for Space Station. Sanguine wants you to take these prolonged fights around fire so Netroid can try and solo it so that everyone else can do the damage and poke you out, and then you go, oh, well, fire's already half. We really can't get in there since we are at half HP, but the Aphrodite is keeping them up and healthy. Even though they got two picks there, it wasn't enough. Braffer engaged upon by Rong Yu this time, and he has found Netroid, who's going to airstrike away from this one. Thorns popped by a rapper just to extend his life a little bit. Panatom not too worried and will send the Typhoon ripping through. Rapper knocked down. Thorns will not save your life this time. A five versus four advantage as Fire Giant is eyed. This time Netroid's got some help to try and pull it, but still four members of Space Station here. Cherio has that ult. Panatom did blink forward there, looked for the engagement onto Cherio. Alau could move in. Fire Giant down to half health. Cherio finds his way into the back line. Will look to chain a few. Has caught a couple. Nika as well. World Serpent in. Rongyu's going to try to pull himself out of this fight, and we are a bit divided here as Rongyu knocked up in the air as Nika's final charge rings out onto the support of Sanguine. But Yarkor instead knocks down Cherio, and Netrioid is just going to swing away. Nika trying to escape, but too much crit for Netrioid. Two members down for SSG, and maybe now the Fire Giant will get taken down. Yarkor has just been unstoppable on this King Arthur man. No one's been able to get away from him, and now Vote is going to try his hand at it, and what do you know, doesn't succeed again. Just, ever, just so much space created by Yarkor in this game, and, and he's always dealing relevant damage, he's always taking relevant damage, and it just never seems to matter. Even with this full pen build from Vote, no chin size. I mean, he's this is ability based Uller here for Vote, and it's great at killing squishies and can be okay at killing tanks because of the Titan's Bane. But for some reason, Yarkor just is taking no damage. <laughs> it's nuts, isn't it? I mean, every fight, Yarkor has been in there with, with every member of SSG 
hasn't been worried about it. This is a big swing here, Agro. Towers taken down, right side Phoenix lost now for Space Station Gaming. An 8K gold differential, five members strong with the Fire Giant for Sanguine for about another three minutes. Maybe look yourself to this left lane. There's still a tier one tower there and a tier two tower as well. Man, this is incredible, isn't it? I mean, Sanguine, I thought they'd be good. I thought that, you know, I was I was thinking maybe this team could be top five, top four, you know, a, a really good team. Top I don't know. Half, sure. I mean, if they if they close out this game, it's really only between them and Radiant so far on who the best team in the league is through two weeks, right? I mean, they're, they're still <laughs> have, we right. still have tomorrow's games to go, but just just based on the eye test alone, obviously the obviously the overall you know adjustments are going to be made against this team. Sanguine isn't going to go undefeated this year. Radiance isn't going to go undefeated this year. You can't you can't base the whole year off of the first two weeks or so. But if you have to say who the best team is right now, Sanguine has got to be in that conversation, which is which is just incredible. They have looked unstoppable so far. Well, you're gonna there. There might be wins and losses, but you're gonna have to wait until Sunday, May third, for Sanguine and Radiance to go toe to toe. And this one's not all over just yet. It is a Fury knockdown in Tier Two Tower, as well as the Tier One in the left lane. About two minutes remaining on that Fire Giant buff. Five members strong for both teams. Five re or ten relics strong as well for both teams. You're gonna be entering a full strength fight here. Only the Guardians left beneath level twenty. Sanguine are going to play this one slow aggro and maybe just wait for another opening. Now that mid tier two is still looming, so even if they get to the Titan here, it's not going to be super weak, but pretty weak. How are you having that right side Phoenix down? Yarkor is in their nook. Panatom moves in and maybe pulls back a couple, and where else would you expect Yarkor to be except being obnoxious for SSG? Cherio cannot participate in this Phoenix defense. It is a four versus four, and then maybe a flex for Sanguine as Yarkor can bounce back and forth. Rongyu moves in, Phoenix melting down, Raffer knocked up, has to use the thorns, and that saves his life this time around. Yarkor still spinning around, will plug away about half of the health <laughs> of Cherio, and maybe even a little bit lower. The left side Phoenix, I think, likely falls here in this point, unless SSG finds themselves a large engagement. Rongyu does get stunned down, Cherio moves into the back line, up into the ultimate, five members of Sanguine, just delaying this fight a little bit. Nobody pulled back in by Cheerio and somehow aggro. No kills just yet. No one, but Netrioid pretty poked out. Yarkor really the only one super healthy, which again, how he's been in between the Phoenixes this entire time, but no one seems to want to deal any damage to him. Or they want to, but they really just can't. Good hold by SSG on that left side Phoenix. And the big difference is that Soul Reavers are now done for both Nika and Dardes. So that, that poke that Nika is really putting out, this is a, a big difference between Yorm at a competitive level, the, the great Yorm players, and the Yorm players that, that a lot of the chat might be seeing in their ranked games is pool management. Benji does it really well, Nika does it really well, as two of the ones that really stand out to me, where they really, they, they put their pools in choke points consistently between Gem of Isolation and, and this Soul Reaver pickup and the Stone of Binding, you're just, you always feel like you're taking more damage than you really should be at any point from these little pools. And those pools basically alone took Netrioid down to two thirds HP and then Netrioid yep. crit Raffer with his thorns up and that took Netrioid down to 15% HP pretty much <laughs> and really slowed that siege from Sanguine. And I think it is worth noting, looking at Nika's build, did pick up spectral, spectral armor, so has yep. sold one of the early items he had there and picks up some anti-crit, realizing game one was, was fruitless maybe without it, up against Netrioid. Fire Giant is back up. Remember, this is the same build level that Netrioid was at when he felt like he could solo the Fire Giant, and I imagine will attempt to do so here again, but Space Station will be wary of it. And they might, Space Station might just have to play Brute Force to prevent just this. And they don't really have a choice. I mean, Fire Giant's already down below half, and this one's enhanced, so it's even stronger than the last. This one still getting chipped away by Netrioid, and he actually pulls himself off just for a moment, so Fire Giant not fully healed, but back to half. Down beneath half, it ticks, but Rongyu has found an opening. 
to blink into the back line of Space Station Gaming. Raffer's having none of it. Sanguine takes the FG, and that's all thanks to Netrioid and some good zoning. It's a mirror image of game one. The dropship is in, into the back line of Space Station Gaming. Cherio separated from the rest of his team, and Nika will World Serpent his way down onto Yarkor. Four members of Sanguine, they're looking at Cherio, and they get him. Nika trembles a few, but you're not getting out of this one alive. A double kill from Shinto. Five members strong with the fire giant Sanguine. Their eye in the top of the standings. This is looking clean so far for Sanguine. Netrioid, plenty healthy. Shinto a little bit poked, but still has those relics up. I don't think Sanguine need to worry about anything with the Titan here. It's a three-man defense, two of the carries, and a guardian wrapper down. See you later, Dardes. See you later, Rapper. Both the last man standing, but it's not going to matter. Titan taken down. Sanguine in 2-0 fashion will knock SSG down a peg and remain tied at the top with Radiance. Okay, guys, it's week one. Sanguine only beat Obey. Don't worry. you know. Don't everyone get too excited about the Sanguine team. They aren't that good. Yeah, right. Dude. right? <laughs> they just 2-0'd Space Station, one of the best teams in the entire league, and did it in a very, very impressive fashion. Game one, a little bit of into mode from Vote. You think, okay, he's not going to do that game two. Okay, he does a little bit of it in game two. But these are just straight up dubs for this Sanguine squad. <laughs> yeah, right. You should be prepping for this team like they are the best team in the league. Because right now, they just might be. Yeah, this is not a team stumbling and falling their way into wins. They are methodically taking them. And as such, 2-0, right at the top of the standings two weeks in to the SPL. This one's been a lot of fun aggro, but unfortunately, it's all we've got here in set number one. And as such, we're going to send it back to Finch to break it down. Thanks, Dolson. Thank you, Aggro. And yeah, that is a huge win for Sanguine. Somehow finding a way to shut down Space Age. You can say what you want about Asterisk on game one. That maybe things got a little bit sloppy, but game two, that was clean. They put they put Space Station to bed. And Mifflin, man, I got to think the only group of guys that are as excited about this Sanguine win as Sanguine are Obey, right? I mean, because now Obey are like, look, we didn't get waxed by nobodies just now. This team is good. They beat us because they're good. And I think this might be good things for them moving forward as well. But Sanguine, putting everybody on notice. Yeah, Obey really high rolled on that one. But yeah. I'm just so hyped now. This completely changes the dynamic of the league, right? Sanguine yep. was the underdog, but no more. These guys are sitting at the top, challenging the king. Uh, these yeah. guys playing out of their absolute minds and I think partially it's due to the fact that maybe they're getting a little bit underestimated by their enemies I mean you can't let wrong you get Horus two games in a row like that popping off completely Shinto on Merlin twice I mean there's almost no respect shown by Space Station in that P's and B's phase and it comes back to bite them with the cleanest 14 and one game we've saw the entirety of the season so far Sanguine playing out of their minds yeah, I think wrong you something like 0-1 in 25 across that set. Something pretty close to that is his entire slash line. And he got to play Horus both games and made it look phenomenal. But I think that it would be real. I really want to gas Sanguine. I'm not going to put any asterisk on them. They earned this 2-0 spot they're in. Respect them. But I also think Space Station underperformed here, Mifflin. I don't see any other way to say it. There's times where Nika dies without using his ultimate on the Dorman Gunner. And I got to assume that's just him thinking that there's no way he dies there. There's times where Vote dies, never using purification beads, right? And, and, and it just feels to me like the Space Station team might have, they might have underestimated Sanguine. I think there's evidence for it based on how they played. Yeah, there clearly is. As well as if you just look at Space Station's draft, there's not much cohesion there. Let's say, give them yeah. best case scenario. Cherio finds a five-man pool. What's the follow-up? A Kuzembo ult? Maybe some Lovebirds from Dardes? I mean, this draft really wasn't primed for success, but even then, Sanguine play incredibly well around the map. They do get a 2-0 lead, and despite that, Space Station does bring it back in the early game, bringing the gold deficit to zero. However, every single fight that happened around the full five squad, Sanguine comes out ahead, leagues ahead. Yep, and I don't think Sanguine get to come away from this unscathed either. I think that we saw their early to mid game farm clearly had some gaps in it, right? Even when they got up to big leads in terms of kills, Space Station was able to sort of out farm them. So both of these teams, I think, end up a little bit exposed, but obviously there's no way you don't come away from this. Hype for what Sanguine are going to be doing in the future. They 2-0 Space Station, who everyone thought was one of the top teams coming into this one right now, Myth. So I, I don't see any other way to, to think about it than them as one of the best teams. 
I mean, there truly is no way to think about it. All evidence points towards a Sanguine season. These guys are going to pop off, and my eyes are going to be glued to them. I could watch Sanguine all day. <laughs> they play really well as a team, man, don't they? I mean, all that practice clearly paying off for them. And I want to make sure we're not discounting Radiance as we look at the standings. Obviously, that squad, Sock with Talent over there, is another contender for that top spot right now. But Sanguine... I think until we see differently, I have to be considered right there with them. But I think Agro made a good point. We are still very early on in the year, right? This is this is week two, and we still have games to be played tomorrow, another game, to be, another set to be played today as well. So I'm not putting the cart before the horse or anything. I'm not declaring Sanguine, you know, the best team or anything like that. But it's just that you cannot overlook them. You have to make sure that you're giving them your due diligence, that in-game when you play against them, you're 100% focused and giving yourself every opportunity to win against this team too, because they will close it out against you if you let them. They will. They're late game. It truly is the late game. The second they get there, they're so at home. They've got this huge amount of experience. Six years they've been playing together, These this particular group. And they've shown time and time again that they work so well off of each other. Despite weaknesses in the early game, they're willing to work around it. Despite weaknesses around playing the map and farming, it doesn't matter. Because the second that they're able to work as a cohesive unit in the late game, they're going to pop off. I mean, we saw it against Obey, we saw it today against SSG. There's so much more that Sanguine can show us, and I'm excited to see it. And this is what the start of their journey looks like. Their first test was you've been putting the SPL with all this, these good teams. Can you win games against them? They've answered it. But now the question becomes, what about when teams start focusing you specifically? When they come in strats, not just for Sanguine, but for Shinto or for Netrioid to take them out of the game. How do they respond to that? I think we're only really reading chapters one and two of what's going to eventually be a great whole book series for Sanguine. But we've talked enough, Mifflin, I think, about what's going on with Sanguine. I want to hear from the guys themselves. Netrioid is standing by for the interview. Yo, Thank hello. you, Finch. Netrioid joins me. The, the, the first blood king here in this set, uh, apparently. First of all, congratulations. The big 2-0 for you guys here today. Uh, but that early game, specifically uh, for you and Rongyu in that dual lane, just working both games, game one, game two. What is it that just seemed to work so well for you guys that, that allowed you kind of to snowball things in game one and even find a couple of kills in game two? Well, uh, I think it was most the confidence we have in the dual lane with Rongyu, I think. Yep. So we're just, we just say something like, okay, I think we can kill here. And if it doesn't happen, okay, we'll just learn from our errors or mistakes. That's a confidence, yeah, it, I think. It, it seems like you guys have some of the tightest synergy, at least in this league. That, that's been one of the big talking points when, when we talk about you guys. Do you agree with a statement like that? I mean, you guys obviously play together so heavily. Would you say as far as team chemistry goes, you would see yourself towards the top of the league? Yes, I can say that for sure. I love my team. I love the way we play. I love the way they always communicate to each other. Uh, we always follow the comms that they say, so yeah, I'm really confident of saying that we have the best team fight right now. I, I agree, and it's just so clear. You can see clean lines of communication, very easy fights to follow there for you guys. I am curious though, I mean, picks and bans from, from game one to game two, largely unchanged for you guys, maybe, maybe a slight swap uh, in the jungle there. Were you surprised at all that SSG gave you a very similar draft to, to game one? I assume as a team, you're just saying, okay, we'll, we'll take the same comp that we just had. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as we were banning, uh, they were banning the same things. And we were like, okay, maybe they have to run something different, but just with one pick, uh, let's do the same and let's see what they pick. And they were picking like the same gods over the same gods. And we were like, okay, let's, let's, do, our, let's do it again. <laughs> Yeah, and it worked again and yeah. long, but but still concise and calculated, I think, for you guys. Uh, final question, obviously on top of the standings here, uh, two weeks in, you, you have a game next week against Rival. That'll be a big one. Do you feel like underdogs anymore at this point, or, or do you think that, that you guys could, could take this fight to literally anyone in the SPL? Uh, I think it's just the beginning. Uh, we have many things to learn. And yeah, we are going to be still the underdogs because we just joined the SPL. And I think there are many good teams right now. Um, we will struggle, I think, as any other team will do. Uh, mm -hmm. But hopefully everything turns in our favor. I agree. And it seems like you guys have a, have a great mindset going into it. The team chemistry, the, the friendship is all there, the foundation, and a perfect start to the SPL for you guys. Netrioid, thanks for sitting down with me. Congratulations on the 2-0 here today. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the only or the first set we've got today. We'll be right back with Knights against Obey.
Thank you.